All right. Hello, my name is Tira, and I'm here to present Trendtastic's presentation on uh, basically bad diets, diet trends within the last 200 years. It goes back pretty far, but really focusing on kind of since the 2000s. Um, so we'll talk about what a diet is. We'll talk about the health trends of the last 100 or more years, and then basically what registered dietitians have to say, the experts have to say about each diet and kind of what makes it um, something they would recommend or not. So a diet is just defined as the kind of foods that a person, animal, or community habitually eats. Simple definition. And usually the diets that are recommended by RDs, by registered dietitians, they all have balance. They're all, you know, they all contain a lot of uh, fresh fruits and veggies. They're high in fiber. They contain a variety of foods. They limit highly processed foods. They contain usually healthy fats. So mono and polyunsaturated fats like avocado, olive oil, and they contain protein. They contain carbohydrates. So the main macronutrients and they're not restrictive. So that was a huge kind of thread through all of them is they don't restrict necessarily besides the highly processed foods, what you're eating because restriction will lead, it's not sustainable. You will want to binge on whatever it is you're trying not to eat and you'll backtrack. So sustainable for the long term. Um, so kind of going in, kind of chronological order. I know I've heard a lot of dairy-free diet, you know, dairy isn't good, it is good, it isn't good for you. Basically, you don't need dairy as long as you're getting calcium and vitamin D. And milk is milk and milk products haven't really been, um, you know, it's, it, they started with agriculture, with domestication of cows. So before that, Humans didn't drink milk, they didn't eat cheese, they didn't eat yogurt. Somehow someone tried some. <laughs> I would have loved to <laughs> see what happened in that situation. <laughs> like, you know, I'm just gonna like try what this is. And and humans liked it. And because it's so high in protein, people were selected for um, to survive because they were milk drinkers. Um, weight gain diet, this was just one of the diets that was mentioned, obviously as applicable if you need to gain weight. Usually bodybuilders, um, you know, people who want to put on lean muscle mass are going to be <laughs> trying to eat to gain weight. So that's fine. Again, as long as it's balanced, has fiber, all of those things that were previously or in that list prior. Um, the no added sugar diet. So this was traced to back as early as 1863, which was pretty interesting. Some guy in the 1800s uh, talked about not eating desserts, cutting out, um, I think also potatoes and grains. So it's pretty, it goes back pretty far. Um, it's fine. It really is, you know, added sugar, things that don't include the natural sugars in fruit and dairy. So it's pretty solid advice. <laughs> it goes back pretty far. Try to limit added sugars in drinks and in desserts and all of that stuff. Uh, the fertility diet came around in the 1970s. So this was kind of derived by a group of nurses who saw that women who were eating a particular way, which is basically just fresh fruits and veggies, balanced protein, fats, healthy fats, um, had more, they were getting pregnant more often and they had more successful pregnancies. So that was a big thing in the 70s. And then I'm sure I always hear about the Mediterranean diet. I feel like that is the one that makes the top of the RD list every year. Uh, I found that it started around 2001, so around there. And then the Nordic diet, I had never heard of, but apparently that is, it's very similar. They just use um, uh, canola oil instead of olive oil, which is interesting. Cause I know in this country, canola is like, no, but in the Nordic diet, they, that's what they grow there. So that's what they use. Um, but they're both very similar, a lot of fish, a lot of fruits and veggies, whole grains, et cetera. The volumetrics diet, this you might be interested in researching around 2005. So it's just eating higher volume foods for satiation. So that basically includes getting a good amount of fiber, 
maybe not a huge bowl of cabbage soup, but yeah, you know, if, if you have a couple of tacos with lots of fresh, fresh veggies, fajitas, then you have a high volume of, um, of foods that are going to make you feel satiated as long as it's balanced with protein and fat. The flexitarian diet, so kind of early 2000s, I think is when, is really when mass media started blowing up. And so people were hearing about these particular ways of eating um, and they were writing books about it and selling books on it. So flexitarian is actually gets a thumbs up by RDs. It's mainly uh, not restricting dairy, not restricting meat, not restricting um, really anything except processed foods, but it's, you know, instead of being just vegetarian or just eating eggs, it talks about being flexible with your, the foods that you eat within your diet. The five factor diet, this one's kind of cool. So 2009, basically in every meal, you eat fiber, fluid, fat, uh, forgot what the two other F's are now, uh, fiber, fluid, fat, I guess protein and carbohydrate. Um, but if you hit those five, those five factors in every single meal, then that will give you a balanced diet. The 80-20 diet around 2012. So trying to think about kind of more in the in the way of the flexitarian diet, instead of being super restrictive, if you're eating healthy and eating balanced 80% of the time, then the tw other 20% of the time you can get away with eating functional chocolate, <laughs> having a beer, you know, I don't exactly know. You, I suppose you could look at exact calorie counts and look at like 80% of your calories for the week. That would be kind of a good way to do it. Track for a week and then take 80% of your caloric intake and 20%, see what that is and play with that. Um, the elimination diet in 2013, this is approved because it's for people who are trying to figure out if they have sensitivities or allergies to certain foods, dairy, nightshades, uh, gluten, uh, what are the other ones? FODMAP, that, that FODMAP, uh, what do they call The oligosaccharides uh, um, in your micro, gut bi microbiome. Some people cannot digest uh, certain things because they just don't have a certain bacteria in their microbiome, gut microbiome. Um, the pescatarian diet I found only really went back to 2014, between 2014 and 2019. So that is eating only fish as your animal source of animal protein. And then everything else, veggies, fruits, grains are fine. That one's good. You're getting protein, you're getting fat, you're getting fiber. Um, and then the anti-inflammatory diet around 2015. So uh, inflammatory foods, including usually sugar, mostly refined sugar and processed things, um, saturated fats. So that one has, gets the, the thumbs up. And then in honor of Cinco de Mayo, the taco cleanse. So this book, <laughs> yeah, this book, it's a cookbook, but it's very satirical and um, highly recommend. I just read a few pages and it was hysterical. So around 2015, um, this one talks about <laughs> after one month, your entire life will ignite with passion from eating, from eating tacos. I mean, yeah, of course, tacos are delicious. All right. So now we get into the questionable list. This one's kind of fun, um, or it's not as fun as the other ones, but this one, these are the more kind of ones that are, they've come around in, I guess the last, I don't know, since after 2015. So 2017, 2018, uh, Instagram, Twitter, just like, you know, instantaneous spreading of information. So these are the ones that have kind of been in that uh, vein of information. Keto. So I was researching and this kind of came around in 1921 from a pediatrician who was trying to cure his, his patients of epilepsy. He found that there was this chemical that was secreted in the gut. And when they were, uh, when um, grains were taken out and carbohydrates were taken out of the diet, then the kids stopped having seizures, made for a really boring diet. <laughs> so they developed MCT oils, right? Kind of as a way for them to just get more calories. Um, and then that allowed them to, it kind of uh, 
suppress the or suppress the, the secretion of this certain chemical and allowed them to then eat protein and carbohydrates for kids. Um, just kind of highlighting the media, there was a uh, just an anecdotal case where one prominent family had this amazing recovery, their, their son from this diet. And so there was a movie made about it. And then everyone was just like, oh, what's keto? I want to try keto. You know, no, not having seizures. <laughs> They don't have epilepsy, but people just want to try. They want something extreme. It's very interesting how it has to be extreme to be interesting. And I don't know, extreme is sexy. So, um, but the the quotes, I'm going to have quotes from these, oops, from these RDs, um, Master of Science RD, this one's Willow Droche. So the ketogenic diet severely limits carbohydrate to force the body to burn fat. However, carbohydrates are limited so much on this diet that veggies and fruits are restricted, which experts agree limits fiber and nutrients. Plus, restriction often promotes long-term weight gain. So, not the healthiest. Um, studies that, there's been a lot of studies on people who use the ketogenic diet on their body mass and their body fat. And Basically, people who are following keto usually are in a caloric deficit. So people who are in a caloric deficit and people who are doing keto, they have the same results just because they're eating the same amount of calories. Um, so this study, even with resistance training, they, they weren't able to gain any fat-free mass, which is, as you're aging, that's kind of what your goal is so that you can sustain quality of life for a longer amount of time. Low fat and fat free. This blew up in the 1940s. So this was all about heart disease, um, mostly saturated fats. We didn't know what molly, uh, monounsaturated or polyunsaturated was yet. So th it just kind of trickled through, you know, whatever um, channels of information until in the 60s, it was this whole nationwide thing. Don't eat fat. Fat is bad. Fat is going to make you fat. Fat is going to give you heart disease and give you heart attacks. Um, and so then by the 1980s, there were all of these low fat products and fat free products. And I remember seeing, yeah, just packaged cookies that didn't have fat. And I'm sure they were just full of who knows what chemicals and just highly processed. Um, and ironically, around this time, this was kind of what the obesity epidemic, epidemic or when it started. So um, they were popular in the past for heart health, low fat diets but we've learned more about them over time. Not all fats are created equal. Healthy fats, like what we find in avocados and olive oil are better for you than the saturated and trans fats, which should be limited. So low fat, no fat diet, no bueno. Um, Gluten-free, this was also around the 1940s. This is kind of around the 40s in Europe was when they were having, you know, um, there was war going on. And so there were a lot of research studies being conducted in um, orphanages and hospitals and <clears throat> people who were di or children who were diagnosed with celiac disease found that they were they did a lot better when they didn't have wheat and rye flour so again people don't necessarily have celiac disease but they think that this is healthier and so uh, as of 2020 up to seven percent of the population I think this one particular study was South America, but a lot of people consider themselves gluten-free, <laughs> even though they don't necessarily have celiac disease, but that's how they choose to eat. So um, it's medically necessary if you have celiac disease or if you have non-celiac gluten sensitivity, that is a thing. That's what the elimination diet tells you if you're sensitive or not. Um, but you only really need it if it's medically necessary. If you don't, then it just creates nutrient imbalances because they're not eating any grains usually. Vegan, this one's near and dear to my heart. So this term came around the 1940s, 1944, when just some dude <laughs> wanted a word for a vegetarian who didn't eat any eggs or dairy. Um, now it's kind of more of a lifestyle. It's people who don't believe in the exploitation of animals. So they do not use any animal products. They don't wear leather. Uh, they don't eat honey. And it's definitely, if you talk to like people who identify as vegan, 
they will say, yeah, it is not a diet. <laughs> like we are against the exploitation of animals and that's why we practice this. And it's blown up a lot. 3.5% uh, of Americans, these figures are from around uh, 2019. So up from, or sorry, from 2020, uh, 2021. So up from 0.4% to 3.5%. So this is a lot of people. Globally, it's around 79 million people that practice veganism. Um, it experts agree that it can be a balanced diet if it's well planned, as long as you're not using it to lose weight. So you really have to make sure you're getting all the essential amino acids. So beans and corn and rice and um, everything in combination. It's really difficult. I tried it <laughs> for about nine months and lost a lot of weight and was just felt very mentally unstable because it was really hard to get enough food and enough amino acids. Um, intermittent fasting, another huge one. This, I guess, goes back as far as 1915, and then it kind of had resurgences in 1960, and then in 2012, the whole 5-2 protocol, so fasting for two whole days a week and then eating for five has become um, really popular just to reduce body weight, uh, reduce your fasting glucose levels, fasting insulin. Um, they did a study... Uh, with people who uh, participate in Ramadan, football players who were training, and they showed that, um, so, you know, you only eat, you abstain from eating from sunrise to sunset, and they definitely experienced um, a decrease in physical performance. <laughs> they were hungry, uh, with, especially with high intensity exercise. So when they were tested with high intensity exercise at the end of their day, they definitely could not hit uh, the intensity levels that others who were not fasting did. So um, intermittent fasting, which is restricting food intake for periods each week has been studied for potential effects on longevity, but it's often used for weight loss. And this is the thing that most of these diets are used for weight loss and they can create havoc with your metabolism. So Registered dietitians agree that food restriction is not sustainable. Frequent fasting can lead to social isolation, binge eating, and a lot of the research on women shows no, like women especially should not fast. We don't do well. Our cortisol levels shoot through the roof when we're not getting food. <laughs> so it's important to have a balanced diet. Plant-based is a buzzword. Um, they've been practiced globally for a very, very long time, but Research studies were just starting to be done around a plant-based diet in the 80s. And it's often used to describe the dietary patterns of people who exclude or just limit animal products for health reasons, so not for ethical reasons like veganism. A plant-based diet sounds like it would be inherently healthy, but it's not always the case, especially when you're talking about vegan fast food, um, things that are very refined and highly processed. Fruits, veggies, nuts, seeds, and some proteins make for a nutritionally sound diet. And then this is a newish, newer one, if it fits your macros. So macro counting, we have all of these macro counters. Now we have algorithms, we can crunch numbers very quickly. Um, all of this analyze lots, analyze huge swaths of data, data very quickly. So this was developed by a guy named Anthony Kolova who wanted to lose weight, <laughs> got divorced, <laughs> needed a, a rebirth. And so he designed this method to, it's basically calorie counting, but you're breaking it down into your fat, your carbohydrate and your protein. Um, it's calories in, calories out. So he doesn't really talk about, you know, metabolism or how the human body processes food. He just talks about amounts and you can eat whatever you want, as long as you're in these numbers. Um, this is a long quote, but so basically, the, one of the good things, it doesn't categorize foods as good or bad, and it includes adequate amounts of carbs, protein, and fat, which makes no food, group, food groups off limits. If followers fill their macros with nutrient-dense food choices, then that's great, right? It can help, help you reach your health goals. However, if you're just focusing on the numbers and you're not getting your fresh veggies and getting enough fiber, obviously, you're going to feel pretty crappy. Um, and then just logging food, macro tracking can get very tedious and it can take time. 
I, I think personally, I think it's a helpful tool. It just, it does take a lot of time to master and make it so it's not taking over your life. Um, but it is good to see. It's not recommended, however, by dietitians for people who have a history of disordered eating. And I totally get that. The whole obsessive kind of calorie counting is not, not healthy. Um, that was in there twice. Oops. Okay. These are great. This is fun. Fun time. Play time. Okay. Detox diet. So detoxification has been around for a very, 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 very long time. And it's not necessarily through diets. I know through studying Ayurveda, uh, so many processes of yoga and, and abstaining from not just food, but, but other things, stimulation and, and everything. Um, Roughly for 4,000 years, there are many cultures globally that practice some kind of detoxification rituals. The master cleanse diet, though, started in the 1940s, gained popularity in the 70s. And I think, so that was the lemon juice, honey, and cayenne. Yeah, yeah. What, tell me about what, you just drink that all day? Could you drink as much as you want? Okay, yeah. So how'd you feel? <laughs> Don't do it. There we go. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I I think I did. I didn't do the whole protocol, but I remember making the. Yeah, and it was just like, okay, my face is on fire. Um, there's still you can go on Amazon and you can Google detox, and there's teas and supplements and all of these products that make these claims that if you take them, you will detoxify your body. <laughs> um, but the experts say that if you are taking care of your body with a balanced approach to food, adequate sleep, movement, then your system will naturally, naturally detoxify. A lot of them are pretty restrictive and they can promote food fear, which is a very real thing. Baby food, this is one of my favorites. I love this quote. By swapping meals for baby food, people are promised quick weight loss. It's tough to meet nutrient needs while eating mostly purees though. Experts agree it's best to leave those for the babies and focus on smaller portions of normal meals for sustainable weight loss. <laughs> Suffice to say, I mean, I have eaten those pouches, right? The puree pouches when you're on the go, sometimes fuel for fire is a good one because it has a decent amount of protein. <laughs> but yeah, don't eat baby food, please. Please don't. Please don't just eat baby food. Um, but, uh, ooh. Wow, I don't know why this is skipping. Okay, pizza diet. <laughs> I I know I was thinking of this. Like, I hope he's not here. Um, several variations of a pizza how many variations of a pizza diet can you have? Like, okay, you eat nothing but pizza. Like what else is there? But apparently several variations, variations exist. <laughs> pizza is great, but any diet that focuses on just one food is not sustainable or nutritious. So you can eat pizza, you can eat tacos, but please eat other things. <laughs> the four hour body diet, I remember reading I don't know if I read this book, Tim Ferriss. I don't know if you've heard of him, but he's written a couple of books now and pretty outlandish claims. So it's low carb. It has other like very specific things. There's a cheat day where you can just eat like whatever you want and however many amounts you want. And the quote is you can lose 20 pounds of fat in 30 days, which is insane <laughs> like that. Yeah. Um, eliminates grains, fruit, and most dairy and certain vegetables, and it encourages binge days. So this can definitely lead to nutrient imbalances and unhealthy, unhealthy eating patterns. When you think about, you know, a diet as a pattern of eating and circadian rhythm, a pattern of living, they can get knocked off balance very easily. We're very sensitive creatures, and that will often create this cascade of events that can lead into obesity and you know, all kinds of different health issues. So don't do the four hour body diet. It's definitely was sexy for a while, but so that's it. That was pretty quick. There's a lot of others, but <laughs> those are, those are the main ones. Yeah. Any questions or comments or experiences you could try? The, ta the taco cleanse? 
Yeah. <laughs> there, you could combine them. Yes. You're going to. <laughs> oh, oh God. And then we won't be able to work out for like 24, 48 hours. Yeah. Yeah.